doing this is pastor small reaching out to you hope that you are really being blessed by the summer madness throwback that we have going on right now in this summer series we are digging in the crates and getting some all-star preachers who have blessed us in our revival season today is no exception we are going to be blessed by my dear friend and brother we are brothers from another mother we are indeed partners in this journey of ministry i've often said he is a wonderful friend of mine and a wonderful example of what it is to be an outstanding preacher and pastor. He comes in the form of my boy OM3, Otis Moss III. He is the pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago. He's going to share with us from uh, the book of Judges and chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, and he's going to talk about this is us. This was a bad sermon, and he's a bad boy, and it's going to bless you. So hold on to your hats, and we hope you enjoy. We'll see you next time. Y'all be good. Peace. the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord and let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath, you missed your cue, let everything that, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. If the Lord woke you up this morning, started you on your way, you have reason to give God praise, for the Lord is worthy to be praised. Praise God. I thank you, the Calvary family, for, for allowing a brother to be here during this summer madness, during this revival time. I'm deeply honored to have this time to be with you and to hang out with the tribal chieftain and the angel of this house, none other than Pastor Marcus Small. You all have an absolutely gifted man of God as your leader, a tremendous scholar, brother, part-time comedian, and a tremendous preacher. And we praise God for you, Pastor Small. And we have been friends for quite some time. And it is always a delight uh, to be in his presence. Uh, I've said before that there are, there are uh, good preachers, but not as many preachers who are good. And I'm so glad that uh, one recognizes that in Pastor Small, the one who is not only a good preacher, not only aesthetically and homiletically, uh, but also ethically and morally. And we just praise God for his deep commitment. And to Sister Small, we thank you as they labor together to the first lady of this house. We praise God for you and the Small family. And it is wonderful to witness the two of you all labor and work together. Amen. Go ahead. You shout for your wife, man. Come on. There you go. There you go. And also to this, to this amazing choir, you all have blessed us. They have blessed us. Where y'all disappeared? Where'd they go? Where'd they go? They, they left out. They, the choir left. And to the musicians. You know, I, you know, y'all have these great musicians. Y'all have Questlove on the drums. We appreciate uh, Stanley Clark on the bass. And... Herbie Hancock and John Legend on the keys. We thank you, man. We appreciate you. You know, y'all got some wonderful folks, and it is just really a blessing to be here. I thought Marcus was my friend. I honestly did. Um, I thought he was. And then I saw the lineup of the people you have, and you stuck me in between. You know, when you have good meals, you have something in the beginning, um, you have something, you know, toward the end. Uh, and then you have a water break. You have a water break. And uh, I appreciate you all allowing me to be here when you have these amazing preachers, people who I deeply, deeply respect and love to be able to hear. Uh, I grew up in Cleveland, as, as Pastor Small mentioned, and there were two courts near my house. Uh, there was one court uh, that was for the big boys that you would hope that something happened to somebody and they would allow you to be elevated uh, to play on the big boys court. And there was the other one for everybody who was 12 and under. You had to play on that court. The only way you could get elevated to the big boys court is somebody got injured. And it's terrible to be praying for an injury so that you can play on the big boys court. So I have no idea who got injured, but I'm thankful to be on the big boys court tonight. And I just appreciate you all so very much. 
and I bring you greetings from the Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, Illinois, and we just praise God for the ministry and the work that has been happening here uh, at this wonderful branch of Zion. Uh, and if we could at this moment, if we could join hands one to another, uh, recognizing there can be no preaching unless there is praying, for praying and preaching go hand in hand, and one cannot have one without the other. Uh, that if you could reach across and just hold on to the hand of someone you may know or you may not know, but I guarantee you are holding the hand of a child of God. Uh, so let us go to the Lord in prayer. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. And try me and see if there is any destructive way in me. If you find, no, when you find something, I ask, O oh God, that you would cast it into the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west to never return again. Allow the hearts of thy people to be fertile, to receive what you have, O oh God, not what I have. I thank you for the privilege to stand behind this sacred desk. I recognize that I am not worthy to preach your word. And so I request that you would send the angel by the name of grace and the angel by the name of mercy to flank this pulpit. May grace and mercy stand in this space today that the word may go forth and not return void. Uh, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength, and without a doubt, you are certainly my redeemer. A Holy Spirit, do thy will. A Holy Spirit, do thy will. Holy Spirit, do thy will. And we offer this prayer in the mighty, magnificent, powerful, saving, healing, liberating name of Jesus, who is the Christ. And the people of God who love God may say, Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you uh, to turn with me uh, to the Old Testament book of Judges. Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11. If you are physically able, I just kindly ask that you would just stand that we might reverence the word. Uh, for a few moments together. Uh, if you do not have a Bible with you or your smartphone, uh, just go ahead and look on with your neighbor. If your neighbor is being stingy, say, the preacher said I can look. Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11. And it reads as follows. Uh, from the New International Version, it reads this way, beginning with verse 1 in Judges chapter 11. Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when they were grown, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a gang of scoundrels, another translation, where a gang of guerrilla warriors, another translation, where a gang of thugs gathered around him and followed him. Sometime later, when the Ammonites were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said, nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us to fight the Ammonites and you will be head over all of us who live in Gilead. Jephthah answered, suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, the Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and commander over them. And he repeated all his words before the Lord 
at Mizpah. Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Uh, I would like to place a tag upon this text uh, for constitutes context of which we attempt to preach at this moment. I would like to focus on this simple idea of this is us. This is us. If you could turn to your neighbor and look at your neighbor. Don't look at me. I'm in a different neighborhood. Look at your neighbor. You're looking dead at me. Look at your neighbor. Look, look. That goes with the folk in the balcony. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Amen. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Find that. Say neighbor. Oh, neighbor. This is us. Amen. Amen. Now find another neighbor. Find another neighbor. Maybe the same one. Look at your neighbor and say neighbor. Oh, neighbor. This is us. This is us. Uh, Pastor, recently a show has quietly endeared itself uh, to many people across this nation. The show is entitled, This Is Us. I, I must add, I have not seen every episode. I'm currently on a binge watch, so don't tell me what's going to happen if you are a fan of the show. I have to thank my wife for, for introducing me to the show. She said, I could not understand, uh, Pastor Small, that, that every time that I would come home, I would see my wife on the couch with tears in her eyes, and I thought something was wrong, and I would say, what is the problem? And she would just say, this is us. And, but she was not crying because of deep pain. No, no, but uh, it was joy mixed with sorrow. And those who have watched the show know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not in any way trying to preach about this particular show, uh, but I do want to just give you a little background for those of you who are the uninitiated in reference to this television show. This Is Us is about three siblings. Uh, per one by the name of Kate, the other by the name of Kevin, and another sibling by the name of Randall. Kate and Kevin are twins, and they are white, and Randall is adopted, and he is black. But they all share the same birthday. It is Randall who is adopted. And the basis of the entire show is to demonstrate the beauty, pain, love, compassion, tragedy, and amazing grace all people experience who are trying to find their purpose in life. This is us. It shouts loudly that family can heal like nothing else, but also family can cut you so deep unlike any other knife you've ever experienced. That, that no one is a villain and no one is a hero. They are the protagonist and antagonist of their own story. This is us intentionally and unintentionally draws from the larger biblical and theological themes we wrestle with as human beings. Who are we? What is our call? Am I who you say I am? Or am I more than who you say I am, even though I did what you said I did? Uh, how do I recon reconcile with the person I love to hate and hate to love, but cannot live without their love? Why is it that I sabotage myself every time God opens a door and I refuse to walk through the threshold? It's easier to be a villain that you think that I am than it is to stumble at being the hero that God wants me to be. What if I'm an amalgamation of pain and possibility, hurt and hope, tragedy and triumph, uh, d uh, despair and deliverance, failure and success? You see that we are, we are, we are not either or, but we are both and. Uh, the biblical truth is that we are both and. The same mouth that sings praises on Sunday can articulate profanity and curses upon you on Monday. This is us. 
We are more than villains and, and we are less than heroes. We are heroic villains and villainous heroes. This is us. Our human frailty and spiritual proclivity is that we will always dance with sin, sing with sorrow, flirt with the tragic, and hold the hand of despair that keeps the residue of contradiction upon our soul. This is us. And the word of God states, now Jephthah was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead, but his mother was a prostitute. Do you not see this pressed between the pages of this story is the human of human narratives, not the traumatic, uh, not the traumatic acts caused by the Ammonites, the Hittites, the Amalekites, the Moabites, or even the Bud Lights, but all because of family. You see, the knives that are carved by family Family can be sharpened daily and cut you deeper than anything that you've ever experienced. The pages of Judges after the second chapter offers an amalgamation of what we call tribal stories that are heroic or those would-be heroes. They are eventually redacted to give a national story passed down from mouth to ear about what the Israelites shall become. And here we have this moment where it says that you have Jephthah, a mighty warrior, his father was Gilead, his mother was a prostitute. Do you see the juxtaposition? No matter how you read it, for those who are class sensitive and do not like these words uttered in church, it says that he was a mighty warrior, his daddy was Gilead, but his mother was a prostitute. Jephthah sits in the purgatory between acceptance and rejection. He cannot be fully accepted because his mother was a prostitute, but he cannot be fully rejected because because his daddy was Gilead. You see, Gilead as a boy uh, was an offspring, uh, Jephthah was the offspring of a late night tryst between Gilead. But you must understand something, if I may break it down exegetically and bring a womanist ethic to the breakdown of this particular text. Because you see, it says that his mama was a prostitute. But if one were to delve deeper, Gilead was the person in power, that she was probably not a prostitute, but possibly forced himself upon this woman, that literally this woman was a part of the first first Me to movement in history. The father had power and the mother did not. And in order to protect, uh, to protect the name of the father, they decided to say that the woman was a prostitute. But I digress. At this moment, it says here that he was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. But there is the danger in this text here that the danger of living in the between the purgatory of your pain and your promise where literally you remember what you used to be, but you still see what God wants you to be, but you are caught in between of where you used to be and where you are supposed to go. And sometimes we stay stuck in the purgatory of our pain and our promise. We never can move to the promise that God desires for us because the residue of our pain and our foolishness still rests upon our spirit. His name is Jephthah. His father was Gilead and his mother was a prostitute. You can still see what God called you to be, but yet you are still dealing with the foolishness of what you used to be. This is part of the problem with the black church, that the black church lives between the purgatory, between her pain and her promise. All the great things that we can become, but yet we see the residue of what we used to be and the problems that we have on a daily basis. Now you have in this day and age that we have literally preachers who are still standing up in the pulpit where they are claiming that women cannot preach. And I I am so peculiar, so peculiar to make that statement. If I may stop here parenthetically, how can you make such a statement? And they will claim that it is biblical, but if I make it break it down to you, you see, you must understand, before a man could preach the word, Mary had to carry the word. And if God can trust Mary with the salvation of the world, how come we can't trust a woman in the pulpit? There is something wrong because we live between the purgatory of of our pain and our promise. That when you live in this purgatory between your pain and your promise, you remember your yesterday, but you cannot press on to your tomorrow. If I may break it down this way, there is a gentleman in California by the name of Father Boyle who runs a program called Homeboys, Inc. Homeboys, Inc. is a program that takes young men and women off the street so they can no longer be a part of gangs in L.A. But what they do is they have a tattoo removal program because in order to be a part 
part of a gang, you have to remove your gang tattoos. And there is one story that Father Boyle tells of a young man who had tattoos removed from his face for he had teardrops of those that he had killed, a teardrop for every person that he shot. But he decided to give his life over to God, that he wanted to be a renewed and a redeemed person. And they said, we'll take the tattoos off your face so there will be no memory when you look in the mirror of what you have done in your past. But after they, he had the operation, he still had the scars of all of the tears on his face. And he said that every time I look in the mirror, even though the tattoo is gone, the scar is still there and I live in the purgatory of my pain and I promise. And that's what I'm here to let you know that no matter what we have done, no matter how God has redeemed us, there are still some scars of our yesterday and the pain that we have experienced. We live in the purgatory between our pain and our promise. And here he is. His name is Jephthah. Jephthah lives between this purgatory for his father is Gilead and his mother is a prostitute. But this is the danger in this because you will notice that he does not define himself this way. It is the writer who is saying, calling his mother a prostitute and writing this story. It is not Jephthah who is writing the story. And this is the danger of defining yourself by what other people define as your deficits. You cannot allow someone to define you. He says that he is the son of a prostitute. Here is the problem. It is his own family that is trying to say to him that you are the son of a prostitute. This is the problem of the church. Uh, the church in so many ways has moved in this particular direction where we now are defining people by their deficits instead of their destiny. That we are looking at where they are wrong instead of looking how God can use you. We are always pointing out everybody's flaw and every problem instead of realizing that God can use anybody anywhere, anytime. As a matter of fact, if you look over your life and look at your own resume, you do not have a perfect resume, but thanks be to God that God can use us anyhow. Am I talking to anybody in here, anybody that has ever messed up, that has ever gone through some foolishness, but thanks be to God, something known as amazing grace, unmerited, unwarranted favor that flows from God every once in a while. You cannot define yourself by your deficits, but you have to recognize that you have a new story. Let me see if I can explain it this way, that part of the problem with the church is that we have too many ecclesiastical exotic dancers that are focusing on making it rain in the pulpit instead of focusing on relieving pain from people in the pews. They are looking in order to fill their coffers instead of doing the work of God. Uh, you're still missing what I'm saying, but I know your pastor went to Virginia Union and there is a dean there by the name of John Kinney who said it this way, that we get this thing confused, that we actually think that blessings are the things that we have materially when you need to know that your blessing is nothing but the residue, that your real blessing is a relationship with God. You're still missing what I'm trying to say to you. You see, You've got to understand that that is the residue. Whatever you have is not the real blessing because you can be rich and evil and you can be broke and blessed. you got to know that it is not what you have materially. It's your relationship with God. When my grandmother was living, she used to make something known as tea cakes. I used to love my grandmother's tea cakes. She would make these things. I know you've had tea cakes. I'm in Virginia. And my grandmother would make the tea cakes just for me, it was my blessing, and she would say to me, I'm making these for you, and after she would take uh, the batter and pour it into a pan, she would allow me to take one finger, and she would allow me to lick the residue. But she would always say, don't eat too much of the residue because your real blessing is in the oven. And I'm here to let you know, don't you OD on your residue, your house residue, your car residue, your job residue, your clothes residue. You can take my house, take my car, take everything, but I'll still have Jesus. I'll still have joy because this joy I have, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away.
And my grandmother would teach to me in this idea, ah, the tea cakes, uh, they're for you. And so when they were done, I would always try to grab one of the tea cakes. But my grandmother was Southern. She would slap my hand and say, baby, don't you eat your blessing until you give thanks to the blessor. Otherwise, you'll burn your hand on your own blessing. And some of us have burned our hands on our own blessing because you never said thank you to the one who blessed you in the first place. Is there anyone in here? Can you thank God for waking you up this morning? Can you thank God for giving you life? Can you thank God that you've got movement in your limbs? Can you give thanks to God right now for what God has done? And we see here that Jephthah is one particular character. Here he has been defining himself by his deficits. But do not miss this what happens. That we know that his father is Gilead. He is the son of a prostitute. But yet it is his own blood that tries to block his blessing. You see the threat that is happening at this moment? It is his brothers who recognize when they are old that we are afraid that you will get some of the inheritance. But do not miss what is happening in the text, that the brothers are really upset with the father, but they are taking out their issues and anger on the son. You completely missed it. They really have an issue that their father slept with somebody and was going to divide up the estate with somebody else. But since they could not step to daddy, they decide to step to the brother. It is known as displacement because what is happening is a form of fratricide that somebody who looks just like me, I decide that I'm going to attack them because I really can't get to the real power source. So I'll find somebody in close proximity to me who looks like me that I will injure in the process. And so the brothers at this moment attempt to push him out of the community. His own blood is attempting to push him out of his community community and shame him into the fact of who his mother was. There is something so sinister about shame that shame keeps you from becoming the person that God wants you to become. That when you hide within that closet of shame thinking that God does not want you and God does not need you, you will always find yourself on the fringes of what God is attempting to do in your life. He is on the fringes of this and therefore is pushed out. But here is the thing that must happen, that you cannot define yourself by other people's deficits, allow people to push you out of your own particular destiny. But here is the thing that you've got to be delivered by daring to design your own story. Uh, don't miss the shout in this. It says that his father was Gilead, his mother was a prostitute, but the text says he was a mighty warrior. Uh, you missed it again. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute, but he was a mighty warrior. That no matter what everybody said about him, he was able to rise above what other people said about him. And the record now is that he is a mighty warrior. You see, as a man thinketh, so is he. Here you have this gentleman who is willing to write the story. You can say whatever you want about me, but I know what I am inside. I know that I'm a mighty warrior. I know that God has done great things in me and God shall do great things. I am a mighty warrior. He is defined by a new name instead of Jephthah, the one who is the son of a prostitute. You have to be willing to design your own story. And this is a message for every person of color who's been kissed by nature's son. We cannot allow other people to define who we are, to tell us what our story is because they don't know us and nor do they have our best interest. There's somebody in Washington right now who knows nothing about us, who knows nothing about our history. Several months ago, this knucklehead was willing to say that people who came from Haiti and other places come from particular types of countries. I cannot even utilize the words that he used. But this person has an ahistorical understanding of history and knows nothing about the power of Haiti. If I may break it down for anyone who knows nothing about Haiti, you better watch out and not allow other people to define your history. Don't you know Haiti was the first free black nation in the Western Hemisphere? It was a revolution led by Toussaint L'Ouverture, and as a result of leading that particular revolution that ended up, uh, Napoleon had to, as a result, suffer the worst defeat that he ever suffered in his life. 
life. And so the French, in order to recoup the $40 million that they lost in the fight against Haiti, then had to sell some land that they owned in America, better known as the Louisiana Territory. Because they sold the Louisiana Territory, we ended up with an area better known as New Orleans. And because New Orleans has people from Haiti who migrated, they created something that we know as jazz. As a result of jazz, you ended up with a jazz innovator by the name of Buddy Bolden, who influenced a person by the name of Louis Armstrong. Because of Louis Armstrong, there was a Dizzy Gillespie. Because of Dizzy Gillespie, we know a Miles Davis. Because we have a Miles Davis, we end up knowing somebody by the name of Wynton Marcellus. Because of Wynton Marcellus, we have a trombone shorty. Because of trombone shorty, he worked with Kendrick Lamar, and Kendrick Lamar created an album that said you need to be humble and sit down. But if you don't know your history, you will never understand how God is working in your life. Is there anybody in here? Are you proud of who you are? Don't you let somebody tell you who you are. But it does not stop there. When the Haitians defeated uh, those particular colonizers, they didn't stop there. They went on to Venezuela and went on to Ecuador in order to free them. But it didn't stop there. When America needed somebody to stand with them when they were fighting against the British, it was our Haitian brothers and sisters who stood with us so that we could declare independence in 1776. Don't you dare talk about Haiti if you don't know what you're talking about. You've got to define your own story. So we notice here that he is defining his own story. He is saying that he is a mighty warrior. And therefore, as a result of this, he says, you all can push me out. And it seems at that moment that this is a destructive moment where he is pushed out, but he is pushed into the land of Tob. I'm sorry, I, I get excited because he goes to the land of Tob. You've got to see he takes up with a band, as one translation says, of adventurers. Another translation, modern, says guerrilla warriors. Another translation, OM3, he takes up with some thugs. He gets some training on some guerrilla warfare from the people who pushed him out of his house. In other words, he's trained as a warrior, as a special operative, as a result of the hate that he received from his own family. You see, many times what you thought was a deficit was actually God using the deficit as development so that you can become the person that God wants you to become. But do not miss this. Can I break something down to you? When I saw this in Hebrew, it made me shout. When I found out what Tob means, Tob has a, a, is a space that doesn't have very many trees, doesn't have a lot of water, but it's still called a good place. You completely missed it. It's called Tob. Tob translated means a good place. Why is it a good place? Because it's in the place of the desert where you really find the kind of metal that you're really all about. You see, you don't find out how tough you are when things go well. You find out when you go to a place like Tob and you can give God thanks for the Tobes that God has placed you in. Is there anyone in here that God placed you in a desert and you found out that the desert was the greatest blessing? blessing in your life because you learned how to dig deeper to find the necessary water to survive in the desert. Let me see if I can explain it a little bit better for you. Uh, you must understand, I did some research, Pastor, to find out a little bit about plants, plants that grow in certain areas, and I found out something uh, that really, that really was, <laughs> it was extraordinary. There's something known as shade-tolerant plants, uh, plants that can handle when you throw shade on them because they survive uh, not by being in the sun, but they thrive when you put them in dark places. They're called shade-tolerant plants. And the beautiful thing about a shade-tolerant plant is that it does not keep all of its power for itself. Shade-tolerant plants are able to feed plants that are not shade-tolerant. You completely missed it. Because they have a deeper root system 
they will share their water with other plants that are about to die. And I'm here to let you know that sometimes God will make you a shade-tolerant Christian, that every time someone throws some shade on you, your roots just go deeper, and all of a sudden you're feeding somebody else. Is there anyone in here? Has any time someone's tried to throw shade on you, and you said, throw all you want, baby, I'm shade-tolerant. And so shade-tolerant plants function better in a desert. And here you have a Jephthah living in a desert. But this is, does not stop here. He's in the desert. He is by himself, and he is working, hanging out with these thugs. I like this thing, that he is hanging out and spending time with these thugs that are training him in order to be the mighty warrior that he will eventually be hanging out with thugs. And I began to think theologically that that is what God loves. Uh, God can do so much with those who have a thuggish mentality. Uh, that God is always working with people we say that God cannot work with. Uh, let me break it down. As a matter of fact, God loves thugs. There's a thug by the name of Moses who had to kill somebody and go on the land. But you see, when Jesus uh, comes into the world, Jesus says, I want a thug next to me wherever I go because you know a thug that God loves very much by the name of Peter because when someone tried to roll up on Jesus he pulled out a knife and cut off somebody's ear that sounds like a thug to me but when Jesus died he didn't hang between two sweet people he hung between two thieves in my book that's a thug he had a thug on the right and a thug on the left one thug said you need to save yourself but another thug says remember Remember me. And Jesus says, this day you will be with me in paradise. Oh, wait a minute. You still missed it. You see, Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise this day. He does not say, I need a letter from another church. We need to make sure you get the right hand of fellowship. Have you been baptized? Have you gone through new members training? He says, this day you will be with me, which raises a theological question for me because I'm not sure who's in heaven. I don't know if Abraham Abraham's in heaven. I don't know if Isaac's in heaven. I don't know if Joseph is in heaven. I don't know if Joshua is in heaven. I don't know if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are even in heaven. But I do know there's a thug in heaven, which means it must be a gangster's paradise. And I'm so glad that God loves thugs. Is there anybody in here? Aren't you glad that God loves you just the way you are? So we see here that he is hanging out with a band of adventurers, a band of thugs that he is hanging out with. But here is the thing. All of a sudden, the people uh, who pushed him out are now the people calling him back. Uh, you missed the opportunity to shout right there. The people who pushed him out come to him and say, we need you to help us fight our enemies because you're the only one who's been trained. Because uh, you've been hanging out with this band of guerrilla warriors. And it is Jephthah said, will I really be your commander? He said, they say, yes, we will make you commander. Oh, you've got to see the beauty in this is that the same people that hated on him are now the same people that depend on him. The same people who pushed him out are the same people who are bringing him back in. And that's what I love about God. God will make your enemy your footstool. And God will put forth a table in the presence of your enemies. And now we see that Jephthah at this moment then becomes, uh, becomes the one who is the leader in the land. He doesn't have the traditional pet Degree, but he does uh, have the necessary training, and he shall be the leader. And that's what I love about our God, that God will take people that you never expected in order to lead uh, the revolution for God's world. And that's what I love about Jephthah. I can imagine in my sanctified imagination that Jephthah said, actually, I have to thank you for hating on me, because if you never hated on me, I would never go to toe. If I never went to Tobe, I would never meet the guerrilla warriors. If I never met those warriors, I would never 
be second in command. And if I never became second in command, I would never become a judge in Israel. If I never became a judge in Israel, there would never be a Samson. If there never was a Samson, you wouldn't know anything about Samuel. If there was no Samuel, you wouldn't know anything about Saul. If there was no Saul, you wouldn't know anything about David. If there was no David, you wouldn't know anything about Solomon. If there was no Solomon, there would be no Isaiah. If there was no Isaiah, he would never say, for unto us a child is born. And that is a pre-announcement about Jesus. If there was no pre-announcement about Jesus, there'd be no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If there was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you would never know Jesus was born in Bethlehem, driven in the wilderness, and eventually was hung on Calvary. If you never knew he was hung on Calvary, you wouldn't know he died for your sins. If you didn't know he died for your sins, you wouldn't know three days later he got up with all power in his hand. If he never got up with all power in his hands, there would be no resurrection. If there was no resurrection, there could be no Pentecost. If there was no Pentecost, then Peter would never preach. If Peter never preached, then Saul wouldn't be converted. If Saul was never converted, he would never become Paul. If he never became Paul, he would never set up churches in Africa and Asia. If there were no churches in Africa and Asia, there would be no origin. If there was no origin, there'd be no Tertullian. If there was no Tertullian, there'd be no St. Augustine. If there was no St. Augustine, there'd be no St. Thomas Aquinas. If there was no St. Thomas Aquinas, there would be no Martin Luther. If there was no Martin Luther, there'd be no Protestant Reformation. If there was no Protestant Reformation, there'd be no Anabaptist movement. If there was no Anabaptist movement, then there'd be no Baptists in England. If there were no Baptists in England, they would never come to New England. If they never came to New England, there would be no Roger Williams. If there was no Roger Williams, there would be no George Lyle. If there was no George Lyle, there would be no First African Church in Georgia. If there was no First African, there'd be no Second African. If there was no Second African, there would be no Third African. If there was no Third African, there would be no Missionary Baptist Movement. If there was no Missionary Baptist Movement, there would be no Baptists in Virginia. If there were no Baptists in Virginia, then you would never have one of the oldest Baptist churches in Virginia. If there was no old Baptist church in Virginia, then there would be no New Calvary. If there was no New Calvary, then you would not have Marcus Small as your preacher. If Marcus Small was not your preacher, he would never invite me to preach. If he never invited me to preach, I wouldn't be talking right now. So I've got to give thanks unto Jephthah for what Jephthah has done. I've got to give praise to what our God has done. I've got to get out of here. But sometimes you got to give thanks that God pushes you into territory. If I can give you this final thing, and I'm out of here, that every year in Chicago, I always speak at a Father's Day uh, program in the suburbs. This Father's Day program is at a small school. It is not a Father's Day like this Father's Day. It's for fathers who are mentors, fathers who are coaches, fathers who serve young people at an elementary school. When I started doing it 10 years ago, we only had 20 fathers. But I'm here to let you know today, we got 400 fathers who show up at the church and show up at this school. But while I'm there, I always ask everybody, who was your mentor? How did you get where you are? And every person stands up and says it was my daddy or it was my uncle. It was a coach. It was my nephew. It was my uncle. It was somebody who was able to invest in me. But every year, there's somebody who says, I didn't have a father. My father was never in my life. And so I had to find somebody who would be a father in my life. But this year, somebody said something that blessed my soul in a way I've never been blessed. A young man said, I never had a father. I had a daddy, but I never had a father. And you see, since I knew I had my daddy's blood, I had to get a blood transfusion. I had to find a new father. Because you see, I've got my daddy's laugh, but now I've got a new father and I've got his love. I had my daddy's height, but now I've got my father's hope. I had my daddy's face, but now I've got my father's faith. I had my daddy's dimples, but I've got my father's deliverance. And so I want you to know he said, you see, there's a difference between my daddy and my father, and that's my heavenly father. And he gave me strength to do what I am because I have my daddy's blood, but my father gave me new blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. The blood that gives me strength from day to day. It it will never, never lose its power. 
It reaches from the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. The blood gives me strength from day to day. I've been splashed by the blood. I've got to get out of here. But I'm here to let you know when you commit to Jesus, you're in a new family. And when you're in a new family, you're protected by uh, those who are part of that new family. Well, I got to get out of here. But I got to tell you, somebody who's a part of a new family, there was a royal wedding recently Meghan Markle a sister got married to Prince Harry and everybody was excited but I tell you what I was excited about because ain't nobody seen a wedding like this in England ever they had a black choir going left to right they had some black celloists and they had a brother preaching and he was preaching up a storm but what excited me so is that when I saw the face of Meghan's mama she was smiling because you've got to know she was a single mother. Her husband walked out on her. Megan's daddy walked out on her. But you know what? She's 37. And 37 years ago, while she had Megan in her tummy, she was watching the royal wedding of Princess Diana. But little did she know the baby in her belly would be a part of the royal family. You never know what God's going to do in your life. And now she's in the royal family. But there's something else that makes me shout that because she's in the royal family, there are always three people around her, three people that walk with her, one to stand and say, I'll take a bullet for you, another that says, I'll intervene for you, another that says that I will cover you because you're in the royal family. I've got three people walking with you you miss your shout you're in the royal family you've got three people walking with you God the Father God the Son God the Holy Ghost covering you every day walking with you blessing you and holding you good day may the Lord bless you real good but is there anybody in here aren't you glad you're a part of the royal family. Aren't you glad you're a part of the royal family? Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Yeah. Yeah. of the royal family forever you shall have the title given to you by the king it is illegal for anybody in the royal family to have their title stripped the only way you can have your title stripped is if you give it away But for the rest of your life, for the rest of her life, Meghan Markle will be the Duchess. Oh, y'all missed this. In other words, God was doing some correction during colonialism when there was the oppressed and the oppressor. But I'm about to turn things around. You gonna have a royal family and you know everybody's looking for the royal baby because we want to know what kind of hair he's going to have. Is he going to have hair on Meghan's side? Is he going to have hair on Harry's side? Whatever type of hair he has, we know that he is of African. So when you go to Buckingham Palace, next time you go, do your bows and make sure you handle protocol. But throw your shoulders back and say, this is my palace too. Because somebody from my lineage is now in the palace. A palace that has many rooms. A palace that can handle anything. That God will perform miracles 
and what everybody else thought was a deficit. Mm. Meghan Markle's father refused to come to the wedding. Meghan Markle's father, daddy, didn't think the mama and the daughter would amount to anything. But look at God. Woo! You left him, pushed mama into tow, but she had to work harder to raise her child. And now, forevermore, the next time she comes to America, even Donald Trump has to go. So even though you had to talk about Barack, when you step to the Duchess, you got to and pay your respects to a sister who wouldn't invite you to the wedding. God is something else. This is the door of the church is open. Hey everybody, this is Pastor Small reaching out to you. Just want to thank you all for tuning in and watching in the month of August as we continue to bring you the Word of God through our preached moment. We want you to like and follow our Facebook page, New Calvary Norfolk VA. Make sure that you are signing on and liking and following us virtually. Can't wait to see you. Until next time, we'll take care. Be good. Peace.